So this is what I think FedEx is worth. This is my price target for the company. It's based on two different valuation methodologies. First, I go through a discounted cash flow and then I have an EV to EBITDA valuation. So what is the price for FedEx? Keep watching to find out. Thanks everyone so much for watching. I do want to remind you, I'm not a financial advisor. This is not financial advice. This is just my opinion. And let's face it, I am not right 100% of the time. So please do your own due diligence. All right, so let's get started. And first, I do want to mention that I have some affiliate links in the description below. If you see anything that might be useful for you, for example, if you're interested in getting Barron's newspaper, I have an affiliate link there that should save you some money, so take a look at those different links down there. And also, I apologize if you hear a chicken or a rooster or whatever in the background. I live in the Philippines, and uh, sometimes you just you can't get away from it, so there is a rooster outside the window just making a lot of noise. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about FedEx. Also, thanks for recommending this stock to Luis Eduardo Tomas Evangelista. You wrote actually two comments about uh, doing FedEx stock, so thank you for uh, commenting. Really appreciate that. So we'll start off for all of you dividend investors out there. This does pay a dividend. So FedEx pays a 1.51% dividend yield. Not a high dividend yield and not a lot of dividends going on here, but it does pay a bit. Now, there's no increased history of the stock because it hasn't increased its dividend in a few years. So not necessarily a good sign for dividend growth investors. So we don't have any dividend growth for the past three years. And we have a uh, free cash flow based payout ratio. So how much of a dividend they pay out based on their cash flow of 16.14%. So they don't pay a lot of money of their cash flow in a dividend. So maybe this gives some buffer of uh, some increased potential in their dividends. But the thing is their free cash flow is uh, kind of wishy-washy, which we're gonna talk about in a few. So now let's move on to the EV to EBITDA valuation. So what I have here is a selected target price for 2022 for FedEx. This is based on an EV to EBITDA valuation. So what I get here is a $241 price target. It's currently going to be a 21% rate of return if that was to occur today. Now if I go to 2026, the price target is 325. That would be a compound annual growth rate of 10%. So if you buy it today, Held it till 2026, that's what I think it would uh, basically earn you over that time. So this is one valuation methodology, and then we're gonna go over a discounted cash flow. But first, let me show you some work that I did here. So step one here is to forecast shares outstanding. Basically, I have it at zero. They're not buying back shares. They're not diluting you. Uh, they diluted you the past year, but before that, they pretty much were buying shares back. So I'm just saying they're not gonna do anything with share buybacks. Step two is the EBITDA forecast. So what I do is I go ahead and I look at some different EBITDA growth numbers. So these are different growth rates over different years. So the median of these is 9.69 and then the average is actually 19.35. So there's a big range in the difference here. I don't love that. I like it to be closer. So it's kind of easier to maybe understand which uh, growth rate to go with. So in a situation like this, because lots of capital expenditures and it's not growing very fast, what I do is I say, I'm gonna go with a 9% growth rate in EBITDA. In 2023 then for 9%, 2024, eight, then seven, then seven. So it's decelerating its growth. Step three is to figure out what the multiple should be. So the historic EV to EBITDA multiples are here. These are different multiples. The average is 10.17, median is 10.08. So this is closer. So this is something I like more. Now I'm gonna be conservative here because again, I don't think for rise or for us, I don't think FedEx is really growing much. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna say, I'm gonna use a eight multiple and that's how I got this. An eight multiple of EV to EBITDA gives me a $241 price target growing to 325. Now, if you wanna pick your flavor, if you don't wanna use the multiple I used, you can use a lower multiple, that's gonna be these numbers. If you wanna use higher multiples that are these numbers. So you could take a look there, pause the video if you wanna take a look at that. Next, we have something called a Cat5 score. This is a score that I developed for myself to help me find things that I like to see in stock. So we're gonna go through this. I think it's helpful. And I kind of reorganize it to make it look nicer. So first we have the uh, CAT5 score stands for five categories. So the first category 
is the industry-based valuation. Now, if you haven't watched one of my videos, I want to show you exactly what this means. So what I do is I take a decile system and I basically rank all these different metrics. So PE ratio, forward, PE, price to sales, price to free cash flow, and I rank the deciles. What does that mean? So here's an example just to help you understand what deciles are. So this is a broadcast industry. And I took 14 different companies within the broadcast industry just to kind of help you understand how this works. And I said, okay, these are the sales growths of the different companies over the past five years. So they're not ranked in any particular order. They're all just kind of all over the place. So what I do is I string them from the highest revenue growing companies down to the lowest. So here you'll see the highest revenue growing company in the broadcast industry is MDIA. And this has a 33.3% return or sorry, growth rate of sales. And then the lowest has a negative 10.70, right? So what you do here is you say, what are deciles? Well, you rank them in 10. So the first decile, the best companies for growth are these, then these, then third decile, these, right? The 10th decile is the worst decile. That's iHeartMedia, right? So basically, that's what I'm doing. I'm saying, which decile is it in within the industry and the peers that it has? So in terms of PE, it's got 10 PE that's in decile three, that's good. It's got five points for that. These are the points you get for the different deciles that you might be in. Uh, forward PE ratio, it's got an 8.78. That's in the third decile, gets five points. Price of sales, 0.58. It's in the sixth decile, which you would think it's not because it's pretty low price to sales ratio, but in the industry, it's not as competitive as it sounds. So it gets a two. The price of free cash flow, 23.92, gets a four. That's eight, five. So the industry-based valuation score I get here is an 85. That's good. I like to be over 70 for each of these categories. So next up, we have the industry-based profitability. So I use gross margin. So it's gross margin 69.40. That's in the first decile. So it has good gross margin. That gets five points. And then the net margin is 6.2. That's a three. Now, you might think, oh, 6.2 is a low margin. Well, you know, it's, it's all based on the peers of the companies and things like that, right? So I, this gets a 100% as an industry-based profitability, meaning that it's competitive with the companies that it's competing against. The third category I have is the industry-based growth. So this is based on five-year compound annual growth rate. I have revenue growing at 10.8%. This is a decile five, it gets two points. Earnings per share growth, 23%. Actually, you would think that that would be really good, but apparently it's not. It's in the eighth decile, so it's not that great. It gets zero points. Free cash flow growth, 38%, but this is a little deceiving. Uh, we'll talk more about this maybe in a second and then skits at five because it's actually higher than what I like to see, which is just 10% in this one. This one's not based on the deciles. So this gets a 47% for the industry-based growth score. So the company's not as big of a growing company as some of the other companies that it's competing against. In terms of liquidity, I just take a look at the debt to equity ratio, 0.84, that's good. It's better than the average in the industry as well. This gets five points. It gets 100% liquidity score. And then we have the Rolex score, which is what I use to kind of figure out if I trust the company, if I think the company is a quality company. And this is, a, it uses an F score. And then this is a actual F score is a seven. The highest F score is a nine. This is good. Seven, eight, and nine are the F scores I like. This gets five points. And then shares outstanding. They're actually increasing over the past year. Now, before that, they were decreasing, but they're increasing now. So I'm going with the most recent activity here because they actually issued more shares and diluted us a bit. So I'm not giving them points for this. So this is actually gonna get a zero. This gives me a Rolex score of a 50. I come over here and I see the total cat five score. I like it to be 70 or higher. It is a 73%. Where does it get dinged? Well, it doesn't have great growth. So this company is not a big grower. And then the Rolex score, because they did dilute us a bit, is the main reason that this got a low Rolex score. So this is my Cat5 score. Last thing we're going to look at is the free cash flow or the discounted cash flow. So I wanted to show you what's going on with free cash flow here real quick. So if we go over here, this is free cash flow per share. And what we see is, you know, back in 2012 going to 2021 is what this is showing us. And here, 2012, 2.61. So $2.61 was the free cash flow per share of this company, and it didn't go anywhere really for many years. So by 2020, it was negative 2.95%, negative 2.95, or negative $2.95 free cash flow per share. It really didn't go anywhere. It went it went a bit up during the first you know few years of this period, but then it declined. So I don't like what's going on with free cash flow, and then there's a giant jump 
and I don't know if this was really COVID related or not. This was in 2021. So I don't want to use this number as my actual number as starting as a starting point for the free cash flow per share. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go with a lower number, just a bit lower. I'm going to go with about a $12 per share here. It's going to be a little buffer just in case this thing does end up really coming back down. So I go over here. I'm on gurufocus.com. This is a $162 price target. Now what I did was I said $2 per share of free cash flow. I gave it a 5% growth rate, so not a big growth rate, right? Probably will lose that to inflation the way inflation is going right now. And then we get this uh, $162 price target. It's a negative 22% margin of safety. So on a free cash flow basis, not looking as good as the uh, EBITDA, EBITDA multiple. What do we do if we combine these to see how much they're worth together? So we take 50% of the weighting for the discounted cash flow, 50% of the weighting for the EV to EBITDA valuation, split them together. We get a price target of $202 for the stock. That's an upside of 1.39%. It's essentially exactly what the stock's trading at right now. It's trading right around $200 per share. So this company, in my opinion, is probably fair valued. Not necessarily a great company to buy and make a lot of money on going forward, but I will show you some technicals on the company. This is a chart of FedEx going back to 2014 around September time period, May time period actually. So for I don't know why, but for some reason, I thought that this stock was gonna be a low beta stock, not very volatile. And actually the stock has had quite a few different run ups and downs, interestingly enough, which I, I don't know, I just assumed it wasn't gonna be like this. So um, look at this uptrend channel for a few years, uptrend channel downtrend channel, very big sloping, nicely sloping up, upward channel, downward channel, okay? So there's been a lot of different times where you could have bought this company and made some money, you know, here to here, here to here, and there have been times where you could have lost some money for sure here, and currently here where we are. So let's zoom in for a second. So FedEx has been as high recently, back in uh, May of 2021, so like exactly a year ago, it's in the 300s, like $316 a share. It's now trading at $198 a share. So you look back and you say, well, um, you know, it probably was overvalued at that time period. I just gave you my target price for the stock being around where it is right now. And um, that wouldn't have changed if I went through this probably a year ago. Actually, I probably would get a lower price target. So um, this is when, you know, valuations do matter. And uh, you can see that right now going on in the market. You know, having valuations, I think, is finally uh, playing out as working again. But it was like things were broken a bit for valuations. Now they're kind of going back. So um, downtrend channel, multiple touches of this, uh, the parallel part of the uh, downtrend line. Now let's zoom in a little further to see what's going on and where we might go in the short term. So if you're looking for bullish signs to the stock, well, uh, it's definitely hitting some resistance that does have some historical um, price action going back. Here you can see a little gap up, and this is uh, where I'm kind of drawing this from. And then there was actually another one going back even further, but this is back until uh, 2020 in August. So that gap is this one here, and then this one goes a little bit further back. And so there's definitely some historical uh, support areas right here, right now. And then if it breaks down through this, there's some support here. So um, I would be watching to see if this bounces off of this. Potentially, does it come back up, get to the top of this trend line? Or does it, what I think might happen more likely is it probably consolidates around this area, just kind of bouncing off of the support, or it goes, breaks down through this support and it kind of consolidates in this area, which this is another area. Or if not, it goes down here. This is another one, right? So we got a few areas where the stock could consolidate. In terms of things that are going against it right now, the moving averages aren't looking so good. As you can see, it never really got above the 200-day moving average, this red little line here. And then the blue line as well, it's acted as resistance in certain areas. For example, going back here, you can see some, it looks like resistance on the 50-day moving average. So uh, it could act as a hindrance of the stock going up. And then finally, um, in terms of like RSI, I'm not seeing it being oversold necessarily. It's down a bit. It's getting close to maybe a support area for RSI. MACD, honestly, eh, nothing much going on here. It's looking pretty uh, bland, I would say. And so that's all I have. I mean, I think the stock for me right now is not a buy. I'd see if it falls down here. It might get down to 150 
to this area, maybe it consolidates down here, then maybe it's a buy. So that's all I have for this video. Thanks so much for watching. Um, if you like to hit the like button, subscribe to future content like this, and watch another one of my videos coming up right now.